All right, so I am, we're now going to um, talk about software vulnerabilities. So one of the major uh, security threats um, that exist is when a piece of software has been created in a court and it contains accidental security mistakes, basically. So there are, you know, last week we talked about malware, which is where the author of a program that's running on your computer intentionally wants it to do something on your computer that you don't want it to do. And now we're talking about software where the author has good intentions. So, you know, uh, Microsoft has mostly good intentions, for example. Um, and you go to, um, you install the software believing that you can trust Microsoft. You know that software came from Microsoft, for example. But someone who works at Microsoft made a programming mistake at some point in the past, which means that people can take control of your computer, basically, is, an is a sort of example of a software vulnerability. So even when you're trying to do the right thing, it's really easy to make a program mistake that causes these kinds of problems. So if, you, um, if you're programming, a lot of software vulnerabilities can basically get narrowed down to like one line of code. Like a one line mistake can cause massive security problems. And obviously if you've got very complicated um, security features, then it can become also very hard to track down uh, and make sure that they make sense from a security point of view. So it's, it, they're often either um, like programming mistake or logic that doesn't make sense. So the problem is that often, and if an attacker can subvert the way that your program is behaving, they can basically take control of it. And then because that program is running with your permissions on the computer, the attacker now is running with your permissions on your computer basically and, and can do things on your behalf basically. So they're on your computer, they're like, oh yes, I, you know, I am that user and therefore they can access all these things. <clears throat> so just some definitions. So a vulnerability is a weakness in the security of a program. And usually, um, usually it's a programming mistake to be honest, like an implementation flaw. So if you are um, writing a program in C and you're copying from one variable to another, if you don't specifically use the right way of copying that to, to basically specify the size of the variable that you're copying into, that can cause a buffer overflow, which causes all sorts of problems. Um, so that's an example of a program mistake. A design decision mistake might be something like not correctly checking that the user is allowed to do something before going off and doing it on behalf of that user. So like the Netgear example in the news stories that I was talking about before is an example of a design, design decision mistake. So when it receives a command, it turns out it wasn't actually checking that the person had authenticated was actually allowed to do that command. So that, that's a um, design mistake. An exploit is some software um, that actually will take advantage of a software vulnerability to do something that it's not supposed to do, basically. So if there is a, um, if we continue with the Netgear router example, um, if, if I took uh, the code that is designed to attack that system, that code is the exploit. So I run that exploit and it exploits the system. And um, for example, it might cause a buffer overflow, can pr perform some command injection, um, but basically it'll, the result is the attacker will be able to do things that they're not supposed to be able to do. So worst case, case example is arbitrary code execution, which just means you can run your own code of your choosing on the computer. Um, or maybe I get to change a database, which is a common problem in websites. So if you create websites and you use a database for the back end of your website, very easy to accidentally leave in um, like SQL injection attacks. And then I can send a command to your website and make it read to or write from, read, read from or write to your database. Um, or maybe just crush it. <clears throat> so exploitation is the act of using an exploit. A payload is the thing that happens as a result. So I exploit this system and as a result, I get to do something on that system. So if I've got arbitrary code execution, what that means is I get to choose what commands to run on that computer after breaking into it, basically. So that's the payload, the thing that happens. 
um, and some examples of payloads. Um, so it might basically get to, to um, leak some information, maybe crash the system, cause denial of service, um, or maybe have some specific code that I get to basically inject into that program. So it might be just a database command or a like command prompt, kind of like a, a um, just like a shell command that you can run on that system. Or if I've got machine code, I can basically do anything. So machine code as in, as in the instructions that the CPU is carrying out. So if there is a vulnerability in a program that allows me to write machine code into that um, program and then jump into that machine code, um, I can basically give me, get it to give me shell code, which is where I end up with a prompt to type commands onto that computer basically. So uh, I end up with the you know the Windows command prompt on my system for the for the computer that I've just hacked into. And then you can run whatever program whatever commands you want on that computer from your you know from that shell you've been given. Um, or you might um, add a user to that system so that you can then just walk up to the computer and log in, for example. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, you might be able to spawn a VNC server, VNC server, which is like a graphical interface, so you can like basically just have graphical remote control of the computer. To be honest, it's not usually what you want because you could do everything uh, a lot more stealthily and with a lot more control from a command prompt than you can do with a graphical interface. So, one example that we were just talking about is a shell code, right? So, shell code is the the best case scenario where we end up with the ability to run commands on the computer. So the question is, how do we establish that connection between the attacker um, and the victim so that we can send these commands? So the simplest version of that is, is a bind shell, where the, the payload just opens a port on the computer that you've hacked into, and then you, as an attacker, just connect to that port, and it comes up with a prompt, and you can type in commands sends the result back. So it's a very simple um, example of a payload. Can anyone see why that might not always work or what might get in the way of that working? Firewall. Yes, so firewall is going to be a problem with that solution because when you go to um, basically connect to that bind, bind shell that's open, so open port, yeah fine, it'll do that, no problems. But nowadays most computers have a firewall that will only allow um, you know, outgoing connections and anything coming in that it did, the computer didn't ask for, it won't allow through. So um, that means that the attacker will basically just hit the firewall and won't be able to even see that that port was opened. You know, think of an, what's the solution to that problem. Reverse shell. Yeah, you even know the name of it. Okay, so yes, reverse shell. So the, the solution is for the um, the victim machine to actually connect out rather than accept a connection in. So basically the, the attacker starts by opening, um, basically listening on a port, make sure that it's, you know, the attacker's firewall lets the connection through into it, have the open port, and then get the payload to connect back out to the attacker's open port and send and then just uh, then give the shell through that connection. So that uh, basically avoids that problem. So a reverse shell is going to get past most firewalls because most firewall rules are um, lazy and they'll basically allow anything to go out and just control what comes in. Uh, so, that, so this will basically get past most firewalls. So some more terminology, privilege escalation is where you um, end up with a different level of privilege. So this might be, well just by getting a shell code you've done some privilege escalation because you've started with no access and now you've got some access. But once you've got that access you might be able to find that you can get different set of access. So say for example I um, attack your computer and I get code running as your user on your system. Okay, fine, I can steal all of your own personal documents and you know, whatever. 
But what if I wanted access to someone else's documents that are on you, that's on your sharing the same computer as you? Well, privilege escalation will be one way of of doing that. So, vertical privilege escalation is where you manage to find a way to basically get um, like a more powerful user on the system. So, if I get access to your user and then I become like an admin user or a root, a root user, then that is vertical privilege escalation. If I manage to become a different user on your system, but still like you know, just another user on your system, then that's known as horizontal privilege escalation. Window of vulnerability refers to uh, the time between when the security problem happens um, to when an actual computer is, has the problem fixed. So if I um, am create a program, accidentally make a mistake in it, release it, you install that program on your computer. Um, <clears throat> no one might know about it for a while. So maybe a couple months later, <clears throat> someone finds a bug. They might not tell anyone about it and they might be able to actually attack your computer in the meantime until someone finds a bug who actually wants to do the right thing and tell people about it. So eventually someone finds a bug and tells the world or whoever created the software. So then the vendor finds out um, because either someone's told them or they figure it out for themselves. And then the vendor fixes the problem um, and releases that fix. And eventually, everyone updates their computers. And once your computer is up to date, you are no longer vulnerable. But there's quite, there could be quite a long time in between you know, the start of when, it, when you first install the vulnerable software to when you fix it, where you are actually vulnerable to attack. Um, and that's, that's an important concept. So zero day is a security vulnerability that is a new problem that's been discovered. So there's basically, um, if you are the um, user, there's nothing you can do. There's no fix available because no one knew about it. So for example, the, um, the Netgear thing, again, that we were talking about earlier, that was a zero day. So there's no current fix. The only way you can um, fix it is basically just turn the services off on the router, right? There's no, um, the vendor didn't know about it, so they can't fix it. But uh, you know, assume that they're fixing it now and they'll eventually release some firmware uh, update for the routers. And I think most routers don't update automatically, so that's going to basically mean that you'll get people are going to have to realize they need to update it for themselves and then update the firmware on their routers until and then it's fixed. But a zero day means is known as zero day because the vendors have no time to fix it before the public know about it, basically. So vulnerability disclosure is like an ethical um, dilemma, or I guess a debate that's been had within the security community for a really long time. And the question is, if you discover a new vulnerability, what should you do about it? So just like, just briefly, what do you, what do you guys think you would do if you found, discovered a new security problem, no one knows about it, um, you found a new way of hacking into your mobile phone or something, what do you do? Ransom. Sorry? Ransom. ransom. Who are you going to ransom? Yeah, the uh, auto locking you know, device or the, not the uh, real device, but you know, the software. That's okay. The, uh, why, why did you not fix it? My device is compromised more every minute because of you not looking at your programs. You're, you're going to um, ransom the company that created the software <laughs> because your software is now vulnerable. What sort of information are you going to provide to them in order to prove that you actually have it's just true. a couple of screenshots? That's it. Some screenshots. <laughs> okay. They might not believe you though. Uh, then I asked them if if they give me sixty seconds of uh, sixty know, seconds. Yeah, to come and you like show a demo in their office, and then they'll have to pay me this much money. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so good luck with that. So you're going to say, come and watch me do it and you can pay me money for the privilege. <laughs> yep, all right, any other possible scenarios? What do you, wh I mean, what, what would you do? Make the vendors aware of the problem? Make the vendors aware of the problem? So don't release it to the internet. Tell the vendors, and what do you tell the vendors? Do you have? Do you give them a? How long do you give them to fix it? 
A month. Yeah, that was a, a month. Yeah, to give them over, probably. A month to fix it. You think a month's too long? Yeah. Um, but Microsoft gives an update every two weeks, every second Tuesday. Um, but that's. No, I thought it was the second Tuesday of each month. But but yeah but. Okay, so. Um, but then I thought the you know the gladness of it that would. Alright, so, so, so this is an argument that's been had within the security community quite a lot and um, as a result there's, a, there's, there's not like a clear cut so solution but the thing that seems to work the, the best is responsible disclosure where you tell the vendor and you give them a timeline. So you tell them how long it's going to be until you tell the world. Um, a month is, is like no, it's, it, you wouldn't, yeah, one month, you wouldn't want to go much less than that, but depending on the, the kind of problem. You need to give them an adequate amount of time to fix it. Have you seen um, the HSBC work I was hearing yesterday on the radio? So, uh, no, I haven't. So, so you need to um, give them a time limit and make it clear the procedures that you're going to follow. Um, the argument for doing that is that if, if you give them as much time as they like, some vendors just won't fix the problem at all. So there's been a lot of cases in the past where you tell someone, oh, thank you for telling us, um, and nothing happens. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there have been quite a few examples of that happening. Um, and, you know, like the, the WhatsApp thing, I guess, like it's been known for a long time, that thing that we were talking about earlier, about being able to see people's status, but nothing happened. Eventually someone releases some code and I bet you that that gets fixed within the next couple of weeks, um, or at least the next month it'll get fixed um, because just the awareness that that brings. Full disclosure is where you just go public immediately with the information without giving them any time to fix it. Um, the argument in favor of that is that it gets them to fix the problems really quickly. Argument against it is obviously that it also gives the attackers a window of vulnerability where they can actually take these zero down <coughs> attack systems. Um, and I would not recommend um, ransoming a company. So there, there are also vulnerability reward schemes. So if you, um, so Google, uh, Mozilla, um, Facebook, the Internet Bug Bounty, so that's like includes Adobe Flash, Python, Ruby, PHP, Django, Ruby on Rails, Perl, OpenSSL, Apache. <coughs> so if you can find any vulnerabilities in any of that software, they'll pay you to do it responsibly. So if you find a new vulnerability, you follow responsible disclosure or coordinated disclosure by telling them about it, giving them time to fix it, um, then, then they will pay, pay you a bug bounty as a reward. If the if the bug that you give them they believe is like a sufficiently um, good bug, basically. Um, so yeah, so and they, they some of them pay quite well, but they, they do require you to, to follow the responsible disclosure. So Facebook's responsible disclosure policy says if you give us a reasonable time to respond to your report before making any information public and make a good faith effort to avoid privacy violations, destruction of data, and interruption or degradation of our service during your research, we will not bring any lawsuit against you or ask law enforcement to investigate you. Um, although there was an example um, maybe two years ago, um, I think it was in, yeah, in, I think it was in 2012 or so where someone hacked into a Facebook employee account and he said he was doing it as like responsibly, but then um, Facebook didn't see it that way. So, you know, you do have to be careful and make sure that you actually have permission to do the things that you're doing. Um, there are some companies that will actually pay you for exploits against popular vendors. So you can use people like Tipping Point, um, iDefense, a whole bunch of other companies. So in Tipping Point's example, they provide an IPS, so um, intrusion pre prevention system. Um, and they release a detection for the attack before you know, straight away, tell the vendors how to fix it, uh, and then um, their incentive for paying you as the person who discovered it is their, their customers get to fix 
they're protected or they know about it if they've been attacked in the meantime. Um, but a lot of these vulnerability reward schemes, I would say, I would encourage you not to use because they basically sell the vulnerabilities to, to third parties like um, government agencies, not necessarily the government that you'd hope, if, even if you, if you did care about that sort of thing. Um, and so by selling your vulnerability to these companies, you're basically giving um, all sorts of potentially um, uh, uh, various actors around the world access to all these zero days and stuff. So yeah, it's not a great thing. So if, if I found some of the and I told probably one of these companies, they may tell them that when you give them some details with them, they see like you found it this way, they might just turn and hack you. Well, no, they'll pay you. It's in their best interest. They'll give you money for the vulnerability, but then they'll sell that to someone who might not you might use it maliciously. Oh, so they don't so go to the actual ven actual vendor. They just they will also often go to the vendor, but in the meantime, all, uh, yeah, so um, the NSA um, actually give Microsoft, uh, Microsoft give NSA details about all the new zero days that they find out. So Google have um, the Pro Project Zero, which has started um, last year, and they hire a bunch of people to actually look for new vulnerabilities in things. So they have researchers, and they have had clashes with Microsoft because they've released information publicly that Microsoft didn't have time to fix. So their policy is actually um, 90 days. Um, and Microsoft really complained that it was not long enough because they needed more time to fix the problems that were discovered. They were asking for like a two day extension and they got denied. So no, 90 days is the rule. And then, so they went public with it and it was only two days before Microsoft were, were releasing the patch. So um, just make sure that whatever you're doing is legal and if you're in doubt, seek legal advice. It's, I would encourage you not to attack live servers that are run by other people. So if someone is running a website, for example, if you find a vulnerability in it, there's, there's not really, they're, they're not, there's nothing um, requiring them to give you any help or listen to anything you have to say. Um, if it's software you can install on your own computer and test, then that's where things are a lot easier and make a lot more sense. So you can test the thing, you create, find a new thing, and you can tell the world about it um, because you haven't actually hacked into someone else's computer. Um, if you attack someone's servers, like Facebook, you kind of, if you're lucky, they'll agree with you that you're doing the right thing. If you, if they don't agree with you, they can always turn around and sue you. So be careful. So the traditional mitigation for all this stuff is to update your software to fix the, if the vendors fix the problem, or you can patch the software, which is where you just apply small changes to the software. Um, and that could be through a third party, but usually from, from the vendor as well. Um, another thing you can do is try and look for vulnerabilities. So you can do um, vulnerability um, analysis scanning. So you, um, you can do things like scan your system for known problems that we know about. Um, and you can um, you know, do pen testing and things like that, ethical hacking to try and find um, problems. And there are various tools that you can use to discover new unknown problems or um, to defend against these kinds of things. But we'll talk about that later in the semester. Uh, Cliff, not on this side, uh, Sorry, we've only got three minutes left, so I need to forge on. Metasploit is a very powerful piece of software that's used for ethical hacking. And um, you have used it already in the labs last week for the malware um, labs, and you're going to use it a lot more in this module. Um, you're going to use it by the end of the module. You'll be very familiar with Metasploit. It's very powerful software developed by a guy called HD Moore. Um, the actual framework, so the main bulk of the code is free open source software, um, but there's proprietary interfaces and things that are now owned by a company called Rapid7. It's very highly modular, so you can combine exploits and payloads and things together to do to do things. Whereas back in the day, if you had were needed to exploit a um, software vulnerability, you would have the payload um, kind of coded into your attack. Whereas now with Metasploit, you can basically choose your payload, cho choose your exploit, choose you know all you know all these different things. You can combine it together, and it does it all for you. So it's a very clever piece of software, very powerful. So it includes exploits, payloads, uh, encoding methods, so it's basically ways of avoiding being detected, and post-exploitation actions, so things you can do after you've broken into that system. 
So it contains over a thousand exploits against um, you know, operating system flaws, so flaws in Windows and Linux and Mac, services like Apache and IIS, um, applications like Adobe Reader, Internet Explorer, Firefox, and you know, various web apps. Um, so there's lots, lots of um, ways that you can use Metasploit to attack a system. Um, and it has lots of different payloads, so you can use the MSF payload command to list all the payloads that it knows about. Um, and you can use encoding to try and avoid being detected. Um, so you basically you can encode a, a, um, your payload in various ways so that it looks different each time, but it does the same thing. So you might encrypt the, the actual instructions so that when you send it to that machine, it decrypts it before running it, or it just uses different instructions to achieve the same goal. So which is similar to how viruses avoid being detected. So if you're using Metasploit, there's a bunch of different interfaces you can use. So there's a command line interface, a console interface, which is like, you know, at the command line, but you have feedback and you can choose from a menu and things like that, which is the main, the main um, interface that we'll be using in this module. There's also Metasploit Community and Pro, which are proprietary web interfaces, and there's Armitage, which is a nice, very nice graphical interface to it, which is developed by a third party. So that is Metasploit, and if you want to use Metasploit to exploit a system, there's a very clear set of steps that you need to do. There's not that many steps, uh, but you'll go through that in the lab. And um, here's an example of the set of commands that you'd run to exploit a system. Um, so why is it that all of the um, traditional defenses that we use will basically constantly fail to protect end users? Yes. Because of no, I think, awareness towards the end users. I think no. there's a big debate, like people know how to use a computer, but know how to protect. Okay, so not knowing how to protect a system, yeah. The big one is zero days. So if it's new, a lot of these defenses, like fixing the program mistake, doesn't help. A antivirus software that detects something that exists doesn't help against something new. So it's like this reactionary, um, the, the traditional approach to computer security is to react to known problems and come up with a solution to that one problem, basically. And we're moving away from that and hopefully moving to a more proactive security in the future um, using things like sandboxing, but it is a big problem. So in conclusion, we've talked about um, how malware and software vulnerabilities are two of the most common types of computer security threats. Um, in both cases, an attacker ends up with the ability to run malicious code in the context of a process running as an end user, or in the worst cases, the context of the kernel code. Um, and this can be considered an identity problem because the program that's running isn't necessarily acting um, for the associated identity and privileges. So the, the programs that are running on your computer might not be doing what you want them to be doing. Um, so thank you very much, and I will see you next week. Bye.